Hi guys, uh, welcome again to my channel, uh, Caver461. I have, as of late, uh, been focusing quite a bit on gem and mineralogical aspects of my rock-based channel. This in part due to the recent release of my book, uh, Rockhound and Experience of the North. So, just so you know, I have in the pipeline some amazing finds from the Bear Lake property up in Bancroft. And uh, I'm going to be doing a video on that. And also tomorrow, I'm heading up to uh, do some widening of the abyss. Some of you may recall that video from the winter. And unfortunately, I'd stopped doing it in the winter because I fell and I broke some of my ribs. Don't know how many because I never did go to the doctor, but they were moving independent of the rest of my rib cage. So anyway, I drew a stop to that and uh, I'll con uh, I'm back to it tomorrow. So... Uh, uh, the abyss, that's a deep cave shaft, uh, at the bottom of which we're hoping to find a tunnel. But today, I'd like to just briefly introduce those of you who are into gemstones to the practice of what is known as visual optics. Uh, it's basic principles being discussed under the term the Hodgkinson method. And uh, if through a practice of visual optics you become proficient, you'll be able to use scientific probabilities to form detailed analysis of gemstones in rough and non-ideal circumstances uh, in terms of buying. So visual optics is about experience and familiarity, uh, a sound knowledge of the refractive, dispersive and crystallographic properties of gemstones. And also there's the knack of being able to quickly recognize certain patterns that are cast onto your cornea and to be able to interpret certain anomalies that you might be seeing. In essence, you take what some might already see to be an arcane practice, and you further develop that impression by seemingly extracting details about chemistry uh, and the light handling properties of a stone with no scientific instruments whatsoever. And uh, if you're to keep that knowledge to yourself and use it for making astute uh, buying decisions, gem buying decisions, you can pretty well disarm those who are selling to you and have them suspect that you are no more than, say, an amateur, uh, not even having a loop and squinting at the stone from millimeters from your eye. In fact, they'd suspect you were so short-sighted that you'd, uh, they'd worry about you tripping as you left the market. So visual optics is an amazing tool, but for whatever reason, it is not caught on in the mainstream of gemology. And I would say that is possibly because of its its margin of error, it is somewhat rough in its approximations, and um, it's relatively imprecise in the hands of someone that is more comfortable with the refractometer or, say, a spectroscope. These are things that give you very precise readings. They give you numbers, they give you patterns that you can recognize and interpret from textbooks. Visual optics is pretty well something that is kind of, you're winging it a little bit, but it's better than nothing. There are huge advantages in simply eyeballing what you want to buy. And if you conduct this correctly, you can leave any one of several strategic impressions on the gem merchant that you're dealing with. So before I begin this discussion, I'd suggest that you educate yourself in the principles of refraction. Uh, that is the bending of a light ray as it passes from a less dense to a more dense medium. Uh, I suggest you educate yourself on dispersion where the where white light is broken into all of its spectral colors and you should also be aware of the several crystal systems uh, only one of those is isotropic that is having the characteristics of not splitting light and the rest of the crystal systems split a single ray into either two or three rays these rays travel at different speeds in different directions and so they deviate from each other to different degrees so just for purposes of illustration if you were hoping to buy a ruby and you were to apply the principles of visual optics, you might discover that where you had expected to see two spectra cast onto your eyeball, you only see one. And so you are immediately thinking that this person who's trying to sell to you is more likely selling you a spinel or a garnet because one spectra would be characteristic of an isotropic gemstone like spinel or garnet. And ruby, belonging to the, to, to, the, um, to the trigonal system with anisotropic properties, would split right light rays in two directions, hence two spectra cast onto your cornea. 
So what you're going to need for basic visual optics is a pair of tweezers, a point source light, and a transparent round cut brilliant gemstone. In fact, I would advise several. Preferably a little larger than smaller, just uh, in case you're not used to using the tweezers. You don't want to keep dropping them, and it's easier to hold a larger gemstone than a smaller one. There are, of course, all sorts of variations to what you can perform visual optics with, but for learning and simplicity, I'm just keeping it simple. My point source light at home is a mag light with a rubber cap of a chair leg uh, fitted over the lens. I have drilled a hole into the middle of this rubber stopper to ensure that my light is truly point source. Set the light up several feet from you in a darkened room. The exact distance for this is not important um, and though a darkened room does not replicate reality when you're buying gems, um, it does make it easier for learning, just basic learning. Lay your gemstone table down and with the tweezers pick it up by the girdle. That is the, the middle that runs all around the, um, the, the widest point of the gemstone. Rotate the table of the stone, that is the big flat part on the top, rotate it so that it is facing you. Now, face yourself towards the point source light and drag the tweezered gemstone across the tip of your eyelashes. I always drag the gemstone across the tip of the eyelashes of my right eye. Both eyes should be remaining open and I stare kind of in a vacant way um, you need to be unfocused, like don't, don't try and focus your light on the, on the point source light. Just stare in that direction. The hand that is holding the tweezer should be resting on your cheek, and that is to keep the stone steady. And if you're always gripping the tweezer in the same location, eventually where your hand comes to rest uh, helps you to identify the gemstone, because on the, one sense, in the, on the one hand you're looking at where you can see the spectra, on the other hand also where your, your um, hand is sitting on your cheek helps you to quickly identify what you're looking at. Now once you're seeing the spectra, you need to begin to understand the spectra. The facets of the gemstone should be casting an arc of spectra rising up at either side of your vision. So it's like a half circle. Several spectra will be lined up in your field of vision, but you should see them in this sort of arc shape. Pick one of the spectra in the arc preferably the one that falls lowest in your vision, so it's probably pretty much central in your eye. In time, you'll become familiar with where that spectra falls in your vision, depending on what type of gemstone you are looking at. The lower the spectra, the higher the refractive index of the stone. So for me, quartz will have a refractive index of 1.544 to 1.553, so it's the, the actual spectra that I will see will be just below the center of my vision. Now diamond, whole different ball game here. It has a very high refractive index. It has a refractive index of 2.42. That's even beyond the range of my refractometer. So I am indeed left with the eyeball to, to make a diagnosis of, a, of the stone in front of me. So its spectra will fall down near the bottom of my field of vision. And my hand that is holding the tweezer is usually resting on my cheekbone when I see the spectra. Now that, that will all vary for you because obviously if you're a person who likes to hold a tweezer near the, the base of the tweezer, your hand will generally fall much lower, possibly down as low as your chin. But whatever you do, you repeat the same things and the spectra and its location will eventually become quite familiar to you depending on the type of gemstone that you're looking at. Now we spoke earlier about differentiating between a ruby and a spinel. Both stones can be red, so visually there could be some confusion if you're not so familiar with ruby and spinel inclusions. But um, in order to see the inclusions, you need a loop for that. So you examine the stones using visual optics. You pick an incandescent light, uh, a light bulb of some type, uh, say in a nearby market store, uh, and you use that as your point source. And um, you drag each stone across your eyelashes in order to scrutinize the stone and its spectra. Now both ruby and sapphire have a similar refractive index. They're both, they're both, um, they're both of the species corundum. Their refractive index is 1.760 to 1.768. So a spinel has a refractive index of 1.71. 1 
it's very unlikely that your sensors are so closely um, tuned to visual optics that you'll be able to identify such minor variations in the refractive index. But being that Ruby is of the trigonal crystal system, that is an anisotropic, it splits light in two, thus cast two spectra, one above the other. And to further refine the analysis, light rays from different stones diverge in varying degrees. So in looking at the numerical difference between the Ruby's two refractive index extremes, you are left with a number, that is 0 0.008. I got that, of course, by examining 1.760 and subtracting it from 1.768. So you see how I got that 0 0.008. This is what is known as the biofringence, that is how far the light rays split apart. So those two numbers, 1.760 and 1.768, are really the extremes of, of the light rays movements. So this biofringence is represented in visual optics by how far the upper spectra is spaced from the lower spectra. So now you're aware of three things with visual optics. Firstly, you're aware of how to determine an approximation of a stone's refractive index, and that is by where the spectra falls in your field of vision. The lower it is, the higher the refractive index. Secondly, um, you're aware of how to determine if a stone is isotropic or anisotropic, that is, by whether there is a single spectrum in the arc, like a single spectrum repeating itself for each facet, or whether the spectrums are double stacked. And of course, thirdly, uh, you're aware of how to determine an approximation of a stone's biofringence, or the degree to which the light rays split, and that is represented by the spacing of the two spectra. The further they're apart, the greater the um, split of the light rays. Now, of course, you need to examine uh, gemological tables to understand the relative differences between the stones. I mean, some kind of stones, for example, we've got uh, a sphene. It has a, uh, a biofringence of 0.135. That is absolutely massive. It's, it splits the light rays in the hugest of ways. So, I mean, that would be, um, if, if it were possible to see that, you would see that the, the spectra were, were spread just hugely, you know, hugely away from each other. Now, what I say might be a little overwhelming uh, if you have no background in gemology, but I, I'd advise uh, selecting just a few stones and learning the differences between them. Uh, you'll have to memorize their relative measures in refractive index, uh, the biofringences, and the crystal families into which they belong, and therefore from that you'll be able to determine whether it's an isotropic or isotropic. Richard Cartier, who was my uh, former gemology tutor, had pounded into all of us who'd attended his uh, famous Wednesday night labs on Avenue Road. Um, he pounded into us the idea that one of the first things that a competent gemologist should possibly do is use the use the visual optics it's it's a really great way to just really quickly narrow down a couple of things and quickly make a few determinations before you go into the into the whole uh, field of testing the, the gemstones and of course as i say if you're in a foreign country and you don't have all of your equipment you can use this way of looking at gemstones if you're trying to buy them and very quickly make a few determinations eliminate a couple of possibilities and sometimes it can save you an awful lot of money.